Hello and welcome to Nit Hrania YouTube channel. You're watching another episode of the Game in a Nutshell series designed for explaining the board game rules. My name is Branislav Berec and in this video we're going to learn how to play Euthia Torment of Resurrection designed by Tadeáš Sposta and Markéta Bláhová and published by Daya Games who have sponsored this video. In this tutorial you will learn how to play the competitive game for 2-4 to four players. The solo game together with the cooperative version of the game is in a separate video in which I'm talking about the differences to these base game rules. Now, don't be intimidated by the length of this tutorial. It's one hour, however, there's so much happening in the game, but the rules are quite simple. Everything has to be demonstrated, but it's easy to understand, it's very intuitive, so let's get started. In each scenario, you will find this kind of map setup table. It shows you how many map tiles of each type for each player count and each chapter you will need in the game. I will set the game up for three players. Specific instructions for the solo setup will be in a separate video. So first, take all the map tiles with this symbol at the bottom of the tile. And since this is a three player game, take these three tiles from chapter one, all the three tiles from chapter 2 and also from chapter 3. You can find the chapter number on the reverse side of those tiles. So, take the three tiles from chapter 1, three from chapter 2 and three tiles from chapter 3. If there is a specific starting tile for the scenario, make sure it's included in the selected tiles. Then, for the map tiles with all other map symbols, based on the number of players, Choose the indicated number of tiles randomly. Then sort the tiles by their chapter. From the chapter 1 tiles, locate the starting tiles for the given scenario and then shuffle each stack separately. Finally, create the draw deck of these map tiles. Map tiles with the highest chapter number are at the bottom. Then place the next chapter on top of that. And finally, the chapter number 1 is on the top. You can put all the remaining map tiles back into the box, they will not be used in the game. Then each player chooses a hero and takes the player board of that hero, all the corresponding hero tiles and all the hero tokens of the same color. Keep these tokens next to your player board, however, place this maximum health token above the starting maximum health of your hero, which is 6 in this example and place one of your hero tokens to the right of this initial maximum health. This is your current health. You can prepare these three action tokens, the same ones as the ones depicted on your player board, but don't place them on the player board yet. They will be placed there at the start of the round. Take the starting hero tiles. Those are the tiles without this star on the back side of the tile and place them face up on these spaces on your player board with a matching icon. This hero, Meldur, only has one starting hero tile and its weapon which is placed on this spot. Sort all the remaining hero tiles by the number on their backside which is the reputation required to unveil those tiles. Then place four GAR tokens on these designated spaces on your player board. And finally, two dice of your color and your miniature. I have my miniatures painted by a very good friend of mine from the gaming group. In the box you will not find them painted. Unless specified otherwise, all the heroes start the game in the center of the starting tile. In this example, it's the inside of the church. Take this scenario board and place one hero token of each player on the zero space of this scoring track or the reputation track and then randomly choose the starting player and place one of their hero tokens on number one of the round track. In certain scenarios, your heroes may already start the game with some reputation, so make sure you read the instructions carefully. Then prepare the market board, which contains items from Merchants, Alchemists and Dragon Slayer Tower. You can use either side of the market board, shuffle each stack of the corresponding tiles separately and then reveal the four tiles face up. Have the healing potion tiles and gray sack tiles nearby, they are used very often in the game. Then sort these monster cards by their type and shuffle each stack separately. These cards are the standard monsters, 
These are elite monsters. If the scenario doesn't instruct you to use the elite monsters, you can keep these cards in the box. However, you can use them anyway, and I will talk about these elite monsters at the end of the video. Sort these gold cards and the silver cards by their color or by their type. But from these gold cards, remove all the cards which are only used in a solo game. They have this icon in the top left hand corner. Shuffle each deck separately. Then take these control cards, but only use the cards of the heroes which are in the game. You can return all the remaining control cards back to the box. So take the cards that will be in the game and shuffle them. However, in one and two player games, these control cards are not used. These combat cards are also used only in a solo game and in a cooperative game. Then take these four elemental cards and place them somewhere nearby. Sort these natural resource tiles and treasure tiles by their type, shuffle each stack separately and leave some space nearby for the discard pile for each stack. Finally, take these encounter cards. They don't need to be shuffled, quite contrary, order them by their chapter and by the type within each chapter. Place this she's intervention card nearby, create the general supply of all other components and we're ready to go. You see I split in rounds and each round starts with the upkeep phase. During this phase you will place one action token of each type on your player board. Then if you have any exhausted abilities, they are rotated 90 degrees clockwise, you can refresh them now. In addition, if you have any gems with their inactive side up, you can turn them with the active side up. Then in the player's turn phase, Players take turns starting with the first player and then continuing clockwise. On your turn you will perform actions by using your action tokens and also by using abilities or items if they provide any actions. Usually you will move with your hero, perform mining to get some resources, you can trade those resources in the trading spaces for gold or you can use gold to buy items or train new abilities. You will also combat enemies and you can also perform some free actions like healing, digging for a treasure and some others that will all be explained later in the video. You can perform all those actions in any order you want. At the end of the round, when all players finish their turns, move the route marker to the next space. Each scenario has a fixed number of rounds and when you finish the last round of the scenario, the game will be over. Players score victory points by increasing their reputation over the course of the game and also at the end of the game. You gain reputation for all kinds of achievements during the game, which is essentially any time you place one of your tokens on the map. You do that by digging for the treasure, mining for the resources or confronting the elementals, defeating enemies at the places of trade, defeating heroes as the monster player, fulfilling quests and also defeating elite monsters if they will be present in the game. You will also gain some reputation for all your abilities and items you gain over the course of the game. The player with the most reputation is the winner. Let's take a look at the player's turn in more detail. As I said, on your turn you will move, perform actions and free actions in any order you want. Each of your action tokens contain two actions, one of them is the move action and the other one is the standard action. When you use one of those action tokens, choose only one of the actions on the token and remove the token from your player board. In this example I can either move two spaces or use the trade action. If you have any item or ability which also provides an action, if you use that action, exhaust that tile by rotating it 90 degrees. If you use the action from the gem, flip it to the inactive side. If the tile provides any once per round effect, again when used, exhaust that tile. Now in the next chapter I'm going to explain every single action in the game. To perform the move action, you have to use one of these move symbols. The number inside the symbol indicates how many move points you receive. 
you are not required to spend all of them. With one move point, you can move your hero from one hex to another. However, on special tiles like the church at the start of the game, in addition to those three hexes, these tiles also have the center of the tile. That's like a separate space, in this case the hero is inside the church, and with one move point you move from inside the church to one of the surrounding hexes. Similarly, to move from one of the surrounding hexes into the church, you have to spend one move point. You can interrupt the movement at any time, perform the action on that hex, and then finish your movement. For that purpose, you may use these move tokens to indicate how many move points you still have remaining. So in this example, I can place this token somewhere near the map to indicate that I have two movement points. After spending one of those movement points, I can flip the marker to the other side, perform the action on the hex, and then finish my movement by moving to another hex. You can freely move through the hex with another hero, and you can even end your movement on the hex with another hero. Whenever you enter a hex which is on the edge of the map, which obviously happens on your first move of the game, add new tiles to the map so that your hero is surrounded by six other hexes. First choose a space where you place the new tile, let's say this one, then draw the top tile from the deck and place the tile so that these symbols over here match. That means all the tiles will be oriented in the same way. Continue placing new map tiles until your hero is surrounded by six hexes. Always choose the space for the new tiles first before you actually draw the new tile. Since the map can become very very large, if you want you can limit the play area by any method like the player boards or size of your table or anything else. When you reveal any encounter tile that's the tile with this question mark symbol, find all the encounter cards of the same type, shuffle those cards and draw the number of cards equal to the number of players in the game plus two. So in a three player game you would draw five cards. Those five cards form the draw deck for that encounter tile and you can set the remaining cards aside. Now reveal the first two cards from the deck face up and these are the quests that players can fulfill on that particular hex. By the way, you don't have to keep these encounter cards right next to the tile. You can move them further away from the play area, just make sure that everyone can see those cards. The action of fulfilling those quests is explained later in the video. If you reveal the hex like this, if you have the elemental pack, place the corresponding elemental on that hex. It influences its own hex plus all the surrounding hexes. For your reference, you can find the effects of all the elementals on the help card. If you move to a hex influenced by the elemental, apply the effect of the elemental immediately. Air elemental and also earth elemental, if this would be the earth elemental hex, they influence dice rolling and combat value. I'm going to talk about it later. Water elemental immediately heals two injuries and fire elemental deals two injuries immediately. This happens anytime you enter a hex influenced by the elemental. So in this example, if I would move to this hex, again, I would suffer two injuries from that fire elemental. If you enter a hex which is influenced by both water and fire elemental, they cancel each other out and nothing happens. You have to apply the effect of the elemental even when you reveal the new map tiles and your hex becomes influenced by the elemental that was just placed. These small structures are portals. These portals, as well as these effects on some tiles, allow you to teleport from one hex to another. After you spend a move point and you move to a hex with a teleport, you can immediately move to another hex with a teleport on the map, without spending a movement point. However, you may not immediately move back to the original portal. First, you have to make a move to another hex, then you can return to that portal and teleport to the previous portal. 
When you use the teleport effect using this icon, the number indicates how many hexes you may move your hero. Again, you don't have to spend all these teleport movement points. Remember that the center of the special tiles still counts as the one distance from the surrounding hexes. So in order to get to the church, I have to spend one, two, three, four teleport points. One last note, in order to teleport to the center of the special tile, all the surrounding hexes have to be liberated. Which means if there's any monster, that monster must be defeated. And that means that at least one hero, any hero, has their token on that tile. I have already mentioned these special tiles, but let me summarize the rules for them. Those special tiles are this Dragon Slayer Tower, Church, these encounter tiles with the fortresses, and similar tiles. And in addition to those three basic hexes, they have the center of the tile, which is the fourth hex, which is one distance away from all surrounding hexes. You can enter the center of the special tile only from those surrounding hexes, and only if all those hexes have been liberated. As I said, the cost is one movement point. Similarly, for one movement point, you can only move from the center of the tile to the surrounding hexes, and only then you can move further on. You can move through these surrounding hexes without entering that center space. Mining action is an action with this icon. You can only perform the mining action on hexes with mountains, like here or here, or on caves or lakes. So you have to have your hero on the hex. When you perform the action, place one of your interaction token with the mining icon on that hex. Each mining hex can only be mined maximum once by each hero. But when you perform the mining action and some heroes already have their hero tokens on that hex, you have to pay one gold to each such hero. However, if you want to perform the mining action on the hex with undefeated monster, which is a hex without any hero tokens on that hex, you have to defeat that monster in combat first before you can interact with that hex. So before you can mine on that hex. So when you perform the mining, take the top tile from the corresponding stack and place it face up in one of your empty sacks. If you have an item with this mining card symbol, you can exhaust that tile, and instead of drawing just one tile, you can draw three tiles at the same time. Then choose one of those tiles and discard these others. During each mining action, you can only use one mining card symbol. Resources from the natural resource tiles can be traded or used to fulfill a quest. Trade action is the action with this scales icon. You can only trade at the places of trade, which are these merchants, alchemists, and this dragon slayer tower. And again, only if these spaces have been liberated. If the space has not been liberated yet, you have to defeat that monster first. When you do, place one of your trade tokens on the hex, and unlike the natural resource tiles, only one hero can have the trade token on the hex with the places of trade. But you can come to these places as many times as you want and perform as many trades as you want. When you trade and there is another hero token on the hex where you perform the trade, you have to pay that hero one gold from your personal supply. If you don't, you have to sell some items first to pay that gold to that player. When performing the trade action, you may do the following actions as many times as you want and in any order. You can buy and sell items, you can heal your hero, you can purchase these guard tokens, unveil new hero tiles if you reach the required reputation, train new abilities, and unlock these equipment slots or ability slots. I'm going to explain all these options in a detail. Each place of trade has an offer of four items of the corresponding type. This is for the merchants, 
this one is for the alchemists and the last one for the dragon slayer tower. You can buy as many items from the offer as you want as long as you can pay the purchase price which is this big number in the bottom left corner. You buy the items one by one so after you buy the item refill the offer with the new tile from the stack and then you can continue with the purchase. After you purchase an item you may immediately use it if it's a one-time effect like this or you may equip the item or you may store it in one of the empty sacks. When you equip your hero with the new tile which has this heart symbol with a number increase your maximum health by that number and also your current health. When the new equipped tile has this sack symbol perform the check of the available sacks which is described at the end of the video. Don't forget to apply all the effects of the tile, in this case I would also increase my maximum health by 2 and also my current health by 2. However, just for the reference, if you want to place a tile on the slot like this, that slot has to be unlocked first, which I'm going to describe in just a minute. At any time during the game, except the combat, you may rearrange the items on your player board, but only the items, not the abilities. And when you do, don't forget to update your maximum health and the number of available sacks. If you would have any tiles that you would not be able to place on your player board, they have to be discarded. As indicated on the trade rules help card, you can change the offer as many times as you want. And the first time you do it during the trade action, there is no cost. Each additional time you change the offer, you have to pay one gold. When you sell items, again, you may sell as many items as you want, and the selling price is this small number in the brackets. If the tile has any gem equipped, whether with the active or inactive side up, each gem increases that selling price by one. Items you sell are discarded to the appropriate discard pile, and the gems are returned to the general supply. If you sell an item with this heart symbol, don't forget to update your maximum health. If you sell any hero equipment, it is permanently removed from the game. When you sell the natural resource tile, you can either gain the indicated number of gems or you can gain coins and increase your reputation. In each place of trade, when you spend one coin, you can heal your hero. The number of injuries you heal is different in each place of trade. On this merchant space, you can heal 5 injuries. When you heal, you may never exceed your maximum health. Only in the Dragon Slayer Tower, for one coin you can buy guard token. For each coin you spend, you gain one token. They are stored in these spaces, or if needed, you can store them in your sacks. All your hero tiles have a reputation value which is required to unveil those tiles. If during the game you reach the required reputation, which is also indicated by this book symbol here, you can unveil new hero tiles up to that reputation level and it all costs just one coin. Take those tiles and place them next to your player board and if you have two tiles with the same number, you must choose one of those hero tiles and return the other back to the box. That applies to all hero tiles of all reputation levels you have just unlocked. These new tiles are now available for your hero and they will remain available even if your reputation would drop down later in the game. Purchasing the items from these hero tiles follows the same rules that we have already covered. If you unveil new ability, which is the tile with this icon, you can train your hero to learn that ability. Since they are not items, they don't have any selling price, you may never sell those abilities. To train the ability, pay the indicated cost and place the tile on an empty slot with the matching icon. If you want, during the trade action, you can return any of your abilities back to your supply for no cost, for example to make the room for any other more powerful ability, but if you decide to train your hero with the same ability later in the game, 
you have to pay that cost again. All the slots on your player board with this coin symbol indicate that you have to unlock these slots first before you place any items on those slots. You can only do that during the trade action and in order to unlock them you either have to pay the cost or spend the essence. These equipment slots may only be purchased for one coin. Then after paying the cost or spending the essence which is then discarded to the general supply, place one of your hero tokens on this unlocked slot as a reminder that you can now use that slot. In order to fully demonstrate the combat, let me use this Tessary hero now. When you enter the hex with undefeated monster, that's a hex with the monster icon and no hero token, trade token or interaction token. You must immediately interrupt the movement and perform the combat action with that monster. So you must have a combat action available on your player board. If you don't, you may not perform the combat and you may not enter such hex. If you win the combat, you may still finish your movement and you may not interact with that hex unless that monster is defeated. Before the combat starts, you have the last chance to rearrange the items on your player board. Not the abilities, only the items, because during the combat you are not allowed to do so. For example here I would like to increase my maximum health and current health by 1 by using these boots. So after swapping these two items, I can increase my maximum health by 1 and also the current health by 1. Then prepare this She's Intervention card nearby and set the value of this white die of hope to zero. Then determine the monster player. That's the player who will act for the monster. It's always one of the opponents of the active player and in a two player game it's the other player. In a three and a four player game use this control deck. Start revealing the cards until you reveal the card of the non-active player. In our example this is the card for the Tessiri which is the active player. So continue revealing the cards until you reveal the card of the non-active player. That's the player who will act for the monster, so that's going to be the monster player. If you reveal any cards of the active player, that player may take one of those cards and take it into their hand. All other cards remain in a discard pile. If this control deck runs out, reshuffle the discard pile and create a new draw deck. If any of the opponents has their control card in their hand, they may decide to become the monster player deliberately by playing and discarding their card before you start drawing the cards. If more than one player would like to do so, choose one of them randomly. Once we have the monster player determined, that player reveals the top card of the corresponding monster deck. This reverse side shows the approximate health of that monster, the range of damage the monster deals every round, and also the reward for defeating the monster, but only if your current reputation is within the range shown on the card. If it's outside that range, you would not get that reward. Then after revealing the card, prepare the indicated number of silver and gold cards, chaos tokens and gar tokens. Here we have one silver card, three chaos tokens and one gar token. All the silver and gold cards go into the monster player's hand. Chaos tokens and guard tokens remain next to the monster card. Monster player uses the gold and silver cards as the special abilities of that monster. Although there is a limit of 5 silver and gold cards in your hand, this limit doesn't apply during the combat. If the combat would take place on a hex influenced by earth or air elemental, Place these global effects tokens next to the monster card as well. This one is for the air elemental, this one for the earth elemental. For the sake of demonstration, let's assume that both of these global effects are active. Then we can proceed to the combat sequence, but first let me explain how the hero roll works. Anytime you're instructed to do the hero roll, take both of your dice, roll them, add up the values, and then you can modify the dice. First, if your current hex is influenced by the air elemental, you must take the die with the higher value and flip it to the opposite side. If both dice would have the same value, nothing happens. Then if the current hex is influenced by the earth elemental, 
you would add plus two to the final hero roll value. Then you can use your guard tokens. For each guard token you use, you must re-roll one of the dice and use the new value even if you wouldn't like to. And the guard token also adds plus two to the hero roll value. You can use as many guard tokens as you want. Then you can use any clover effects. Those are effects with this clover symbol. For example, this earth essence after discarding adds plus eight to the final hero roll value. So in this example, we have five plus two is seven, plus two is nine, plus two 11, plus eight is 19. All the guard tokens and essences are discarded to the general supply. Now we can move to the combat sequence. First of all, if you have any first strike weapon or first strike ability, you may use it one time before the combat rounds. Once you use that first strike weapon or the first strike ability, you will no longer be able to use it during combat. Then each combat round has four phases. First one is the hero healing phase. Second is the monster attack phase. Third phase is again hero healing phase. And the fourth one is the hero attack phase. If both hero and the monster would be still alive at the end of the first combat round, proceed to the next combat round, which is again hero healing phase, monster attack phase, hero healing phase, hero attack phase. Continue this way until either hero dies or the monster is defeated. Now I will show you the entire combat in a detail. To perform the first strike attack, you have to have a first strike weapon, which is the tile with this icon and this flash symbol in the top left hand corner, or first strike ability, which is the ability with this icon, and again the flash symbol in the top left hand corner. But before you use that weapon or the ability, you may use any before the hero roll items or abilities, they have this left pointing icon, or you can use this fire essence to add plus three to the damage dealt by this attack. So let's say I will decide to use this potion. It has to be discarded, but let me keep it nearby as a reminder of these effects. Then choose one and only one first strike weapon or ability and perform the standard hero roll. Take the dice, then roll the dice. And before anything else, since we are in a combat, check the she's intervention effect. This card is only used in the combat. Whenever your initial hero roll value is between two to five, including, increase the value of this white die of hope by one. This is a sort of a compensation for a low hero roll value. Then apply the effect of the air elemental, flip the die with the higher value to the opposite side. And now we can further modify the dice by using the guard tokens and clover effects. You can also apply any after the hero roll items and abilities. They have this right pointing arrow. Tessary doesn't have such items or abilities. That's why I'm showing the one from another hero. Since this rusty dart deals one damage, if the total combat value is eight or higher, there's no need to further modify the dice because the value of the dice is six. Here we have the clover effect, which adds plus two to this total combat value. And here we have the earth elemental effect, which also adds plus two to the final combat value. So we can move to the next step, which is applying the damage. The rusty dart does one damage and the potion deals additional two damage to the monster. So use the damage tokens to indicate the damage dealt to the monster. We dealt three damage, monster health is four, so the monster is still alive. Note that some monsters have this negative clover effect at the bottom of the card. It's called the hero penalty, and it is applied during the first strike, and then later during the hero attack phase. It simply means that you have to subtract four from your final combat value. If we would be in the combat with this dragonfly, since our combat value was 10, it would be reduced by four down to six, and that means the rusty dart would deal no damage. And since this rusty dart would deal no damage, this potion would also give no additional damage because these plus two or minus two damages 
only apply if you do some damage with your weapon or the ability. Fortunately, we are not in a combat with the Dragonfly. Our first strike dealt 3 damage to the Shadow Beast. We have to discard that potion. And now it's time for the standard combat rounds. The first phase of each combat round is the hero healing phase. During the healing phase, you may use any items or abilities with this healing effect. And this icon indicates that these healing potions may be used both during the combat and outside the combat. But if it's used during the combat, you can only use it during the hero healing phase. This means that I can heal two of my injuries, so I can increase my current health by two. With that, I have to discard the healing potion. Since I don't want to use any further healing, we can move to the monster attack phase. The monster attack phase starts with a step called before the monster attack roll. During this step, the hero plays first, and they may play the abilities and items with this icon. It's the monster icon with the left pointing arrow that indicates items and abilities that are played before the monster roll. So let's say we decide to use this ability. It reduces the final combat value of the monster by 3 and the total damage dealt by the monster by 1. Since we are using the ability, we have to exhaust that ability by rotating it 90 degrees clockwise. And you can play as many before the monster roll abilities as you want. And you can also use this air essence. With this effect, the monster player may only roll and use one die for the remainder of the combat. Then the monster player can use the before the monster roll effects. And these come from the gold and silver cards. In order to use these silver and gold cards, the monster has to have these chaos tokens available. When the monster player plays the card with the before the monster roll ability, that player has to use one of the chaos tokens. And now, if that player only plays one copy of the card, apply the effect which is listed at the top of the card. But if the monster player plays two copies of the same card, you still only need one chaos token, but you would apply the bottom effect which is the stronger effect of the card. The chaos token is then discarded. Gold cards have three sections on the card, because when you play one copy of the card, you apply the effect of the top section. When you play two copies of the same card, you apply the effect in the middle section. And when you play three gold cards at the same time, you apply the strongest effect at the bottom of the card. Again, regardless of how many copies of the card you play, you only spend one chaos token. For our example, let's say the monster player only uses one copy of this gold card. Again, note that the timing is before the monster roll. This symbol means that the monster will heal one injury and the regenerate effect means that at the start of the next combat round, at the start of the next monster phase, the monster will regenerate one injury. When the monster player is finished playing the cards with this before the monster roll timing, it's time to roll the dice. And after rolling the die, again, first and foremost, check the she's intervention effect. If the monster would roll 10, 11 or 12, you would increase the value of the die by one. Since we only have one die, that doesn't happen. And also, since we only have one die, the effect of the air elemental is not applied. Now, players may use after the monster roll items and abilities, starting with the monster player. The monster player can either use the guard tokens or silver or gold cards with this after the monster roll timing. Again, to use such a card, monster player has to use the chaos token. Let's say the monster player only has one copy of the mind control card, so that will add plus five to the total combat value of the monster. Now, hero can react, but only with the guard tokens. For each guard token, place it with the red side up, it reduces the combat value by two, and the hero player must reroll one of the dice. Then it's back to the monster player. And again, monster player may use guard tokens or silver or gold cards. If the monster player decides to use the guard token, 
This time, place it with the blue side up. It increases the combat value by two, and the monster player must reroll one of the dice. And then it's back to the hero player, who may only use guard tokens, and so on and so forth. Let's say the hero player decides to use another guard token. Again, take the token, place it with the red side up, and reroll one of the dice. You must use that die value even if you don't like it. Now, the monster player doesn't have any guard tokens or chaos tokens, so the monster player must pass, and the hero player again may use one of the guard tokens or pass as well. If both players pass consecutively, we move to the next step in which the hero may now play after the monster roll abilities or items. So, for example, we can use this one, which reduces the total combat value of the monster by 4. Hero player may no longer use the guard tokens, and the monster player may not do anything. After that, we move to the damage step. So first, let's calculate the total combat value of the monster. The die value is 6, which is increased by 2 and reduced by 4, so we're at 4. We have plus 2 from this healing card, which is 6, plus 5 from the mind control, which is 11, and plus 2 from the earth elemental effect. So that's 13. That is reduced by 3 and by 4, so 13 minus 7 is 6. Since the monster player activated this bottom effect on this enhancement card, the monster would not deal additional plus 2 damage because the total combat value is only 6. The monster player may not apply this upper effect on the card because he activated this bottom effect. So since the total combat value is 6, based on the range on the monster card, the monster would deal 2 damage, but that is reduced by the ability of the hero, so the total damage is only 1. The hero would suffer one injury, and that's the end of the monster attack phase. At the end of this monster attack phase, discard all the guard tokens used, and the next phase is another hero healing phase. So, for example, I can use this water essence to heal four injuries, but remember, you may never exceed your maximum health. Then we can proceed to the hero attack phase. Again, the first step is the before the roll step. This time the monster player acts first, and they may play the cards with this before the hero roll icon, but for that they would need the chaos tokens, since the monster has no more chaos tokens available, the monster player may not play any cards. Then the hero may play any before the roll items or abilities, or these fire essences, which add plus 3 damage. Remember, those items and abilities have this left pointing arrow icon, but we don't have any remaining items or abilities with that timing, so we move to the hero attack. For the attack, you must choose only one weapon or ability with this helmet icon. You may not use the weapons or abilities with the first strike icon. So choose one, and if it's the ability, it has to be exhausted. Then roll the dice, and again, since we are in a combat, first thing you do is check for the she's intervention effect. The initial value of our dice is 5, which means we can increase the value of the die of hope by 1. Then apply the effect of the air elemental, which means you flip the die with the higher value to the opposite side. After that, it's time for the after the roll abilities and items. However, in this hero attack phase, only the hero may use the guard tokens and clover effects to modify the total combat value. The monster player doesn't have any option. Although there is one exception, which is the soul control card, but that has to be played during the monster attack phase. So let's say we want to use another guard token, that increases the total combat value by 2. Now we can reroll one die, and that should be sufficient. So here we have 6, plus 2 from the guard token, plus 2 from the earth elemental, that is 10 in total but that is reduced by 2 from the enhancement effect of the monster. That makes it 8 as the final combat value. The same as during the first strike, 
If you would have any after the hero roll items abilities, you would be able to use them now. And again, since it is the hero attack, apply this hero penalty if it's stated on the monster card. The hero player could now also use the effects from the She's Intervention card. When you spend one pip from the die value, you get plus one clover effect. If you spend two, you get additional guard token. Obviously, you may also use the clover effect from your player board. But since the final combat value is eight, the damage dealt to the monster is two. Since the total damage on the monster card equals or is higher than the health of the monster, the monster is defeated. So that's the end of the hero attack phase. Discard all the guard tokens. And since the monster is defeated, it's also the end of the combat. Don't forget to discard the air essence if you used it during the combat. If at the end of the hero attack phase, both hero and monster would still be alive, you would proceed to the next combat round. That would be the hero healing phase, monster attack phase, hero healing phase, hero attack phase. At the start of the each monster attack phase, discard all the gold and silver cards from the previous combat round, but keep the cards with the permanent effect. Here there is a regenerate one, so the monster would regenerate one injury. If your hero would be equipped with any kind of shield, you may use that shield every combat round because it never gets exhausted. And when you do, place one of your hero tokens on the shield to indicate that the combat value of the monster is reduced by the depicted value. But even your own combat value in your next hero roll will be reduced by the value shown on this clover effect. Then at the end of the combat round, remove that hero token. If you decide not to use the shield, you would not reduce the combat value of the monster player, but you would also not suffer the penalty for your own roll. Now, if the monster was defeated, flip the card to the other side and gain the depicted reward if your reputation is within the range shown on the card. Discard the gold and silver cards, but all the remaining cards in the monster player's hand remain in their hand, although now the limit of the five cards applies. If the value of the Die of Hope is at least two, you can use the effect of the She's Intervention card to gain additional guard tokens for each two pips on the die. The creature card can be discarded, or if you want, and if you have a free space available, free sack, you may keep it in your sack because it may be needed to fulfill some quests. Take the loot from the hex, which in this case would be four coins, if you would defeat a monster on this hex, for example, in addition to one coin, you would also gain two healing potions. And then place one of your tokens on the hex. Since this is a place of trade, you would place one of your trade tokens there. The hex is now liberated and you can interact with that hex. If you would have any actions remaining, including any movement points, you can continue with your turn. When you defeat the monster on the mining hex, place two interaction tokens with this side up on that hex, which indicates that you have defeated the monster here, but you have not taken the mining action yet. When you do, remove one of those interaction tokens. When there's only one remaining, it means you have taken the mining action there and you may no longer mine on that hex. And finally, if you defeat the monster on any other hex, Place your hero token on such hex. If your hero is defeated, return back to the center of the church tile, back to the church where you are resurrected, you lose all the remaining movement points, restore your health back to the maximum level, and place the monster card back on top of the monster deck. If the monster would still have any gar or chaos tokens remaining, discard those tokens. The hero player takes one gold card into their hand as a compensation and also three guard tokens. You may also take additional guard tokens from the She's Intervention card if the Die of Hope would have the value two or more. The monster player takes one of the defeated hero tokens on their player board. This will be important for the endgame scoring. 
Then if you still have any actions remaining, you can continue with your turn. In addition to actions provided by action tokens and items or abilities, and for those you don't need any items, abilities or action tokens, but they can only be performed in specific locations. First, let's start with the actions you can perform at the church. You have two options there. For one gold you can buy one healing potion, and for one gold you can heal six injuries. You can repeat these effects as many times as you want. Remember, these are free actions, these are not trade actions. When you enter the treasure hex, you may dig for treasure. This is a level 1 treasure hex, this is a level 2 treasure hex, and this level 3 treasure hex. When you perform this free action, digging for the treasure, place one of your hero tokens on the hex and draw the top tile from the corresponding stack. These are the tiles for the level 2 treasures and these for the level 3 treasures. You can only dig for the treasure on the treasure hexes without any hero tokens. As long as any hero already has a token on the hex, it indicates that the treasure has been found and no other hero may dig for the treasure there. When your hero is on the encounter hex, you may fulfill one or both of the quests of the corresponding type. In this example, the hero must have one of these depicted natural resources. This yellow box on each encounter card contains the requirements to fulfill the quest. At the bottom of the card you find the reward for your quest. You can find the full description of all the quests in the appendix. After you fulfill the quest, take the reward, take the encounter card, place it next to your player board, you will need it for the endgame scoring. Don't refill the cards now, you will do it at the end of your turn. When you are on the hex with an elemental, you may decide to confront that elemental. If you don't want to do that, nothing happens, you can even end your movement on the same hex as that elemental. But if you decide to confront it, first if any other player would already have the interaction token on that hex, you have to pay one gold to each such player then place one of your interaction tokens with the elemental side up on that hex, take the corresponding elemental card and perform the standard hero roll which we have already covered in the video. Then based on the final value of that hero roll after all modifications, apply the corresponding effect from that elemental card. Again, you can find the full description of all those effects in the appendix. If your final hero roll value would be outside of that range, so for example here if we would have the value 5, you would gain no benefit. When your hero dies when confronting the elemental, which may happen when you confront the air or fire elemental, you don't get any positive effect. Once you confront an elemental, you may no longer confront the same elementer on that hex again later in the game. Those hero interaction tokens on the hex with an elemental don't change the effect of that elemental. So this earth elemental still influences its own hex and all the surrounding hexes. At the end of your turn, first if you fulfilled any quests during your turn, refill the display of those quests. And then if you still have any action token remaining, you may place it on this fourth slot on your player board. You will have that action token available on your next turn. Remember only at the start of your next turn you will place one action token of each type on your player board. The game ends at the end of the predetermined number of rounds. It's different for each scenario. For the final scoring, each hero must first calculate the value of their possessions. First, sum up the purchase value of all your hero tiles. You can then remove those tiles and either place the corresponding number of coins on your player board or write that number somewhere down on a piece of paper. Then add this coin value of all the unlocked hero slots including the slots that were unlocked but not occupied by any hero tile. So here you would have plus 4, plus 5 and plus 7. If you would have any essences, for each essence you would add plus 2 to the value of your possessions. 
and you also gain plus two to the value of your possessions for each of your gems in your storage or on your equipment. Then add the purchase price of all your equipment and items on your player board, plus the coin value of all unlocked equipment slots. And if you have any natural resources, if there is a reputation value, take that reputation and the gold. If there's no reputation, simply take the highest value of gold. Then gain one reputation for each five gold in your possession, round it down. You can find the overview of the scoring on one of the help cards. Once you finish evaluating your possession and gaining the reputation for the possessions, flip the card to the other side and gain reputation for the number of your hero tokens, interaction tokens and trade tokens on the map, which means you need to count the number of physical trade tokens, hero tokens, interaction tokens, and based on their number on the map, gain the corresponding reputation. Then you lose two reputation for each of your hero tokens on other players' player boards, so for each time you were killed. And then count the hero tokens of other players on your player board and gain reputation as shown in the table. Add the reputations for any quests you have completed and also for the elite monsters you have defeated. I will talk about the elite monsters in a minute. Then the player with the most reputation wins the game. If any deck of cards in the game runs out, reshuffle the discard pile and create the new draw deck. The only exception to this rule are the encounter cards. Once they run out, no new encounter cards of the given type will be added to the display. Players in the game are not allowed to do any trading among themselves, not even in the cooperative scenarios. And finally, all the tokens are meant to be unlimited in the game. If for some reason they run out, use some replacements. Whenever you acquire an item, you must immediately use it or equip it or store it in one of your sacks. Or if you would have no room for that item, you must discard it. Weapons and shields must be placed on the slots with the corresponding icon. And the same applies for abilities. They may only be placed on these spots. And also the equipment must be placed on the slots of the corresponding type. Some items may have slots for gems. Once you place the gem on the item, it can never be removed, sold or used to fulfill a quest. However, each gem increases the selling price of that item by one. Some gems may be used for an effect. This is the active side of the gem. When you flip it to the inactive side, you may use the effect of that gem. Some of those effects are permanent effects. You may use the effect of the gem independently of other effects on that tile. So in this example, I can exhaust this item to gain one movement point, but the one movement point from the gem is still available and I can use it later that turn. Gems in your storage may not be used for their effect. You have to equip them first. These armor tiles come in six different types distinguished by six different colors of the background. Here we have the red background, here for example we have the blue background and so on. Armor tiles of the same color are called an armor set. Some abilities may have a triangle or a square or a pentagon icon and that indicates that you can only use the effect of that ability if you have the appropriate number of the armor tiles from one set. The square icon indicates that you must have at least four item tiles of the same armor. If you only have three or fewer, you may not use that ability. As long as you have four or the full armor set, you can use that ability. Essences can only be stored in this section on your player board or in your sacks. They can be used for their effect, they can be sold for two coins each, or you can use them to unlock the slots on your player board or to fulfill the quests. Finally, these sack symbols are permanent effects. The maximum number of sacks you can have is three. 
If you have the tile with this sag icon and the number inside that icon, these are permanent effects and they have an impact on the number of sags you have available. If an item has a negative number, place that many gray sag tiles on your sags and these slots are unavailable. If you have a tile which increases that number, you can remove one of those gray sag tiles. However, the maximum number of your sag slots is three. So if you would only have the tiles which increase that number, you would still only have three sags. The sum of your sag modifiers may never be less than minus three. If that ever happens, you must rearrange those items on your player board, or if needed, you must discard some of them. Elite monsters are required in certain scenarios, but if you want, you can play with them in any scenario. To set them up, sort the bounty cards by the level of those monsters, shuffle each stack separately, and then draw the number of cards equal to the number of players in the game plus two. So in a three player game, we would have five cards. Do the same with the level two elite monsters and potentially level three. Then shuffle those bounty cards and create the draw deck Place the bounty cards of the monsters of the highest level at the bottom and the lowest level on top. Sort the elite monsters by their type, but you don't need to shuffle these cards because from that draw deck, reveal the top card and find the corresponding monster in the deck of the monsters of the same type. So here we have the basilisks and it's the first elite monster available. Each elite monster has a layer which is shown on the bounty card. Here it's a mountain hex. In this example, it would be any of the surrounding hexes around the earth elemental. And in this case, it would be one of those three hexes around the structure, not the center of the tile, one of those three surrounding hexes. Then if you are at that layer, so let's say your hero is on the mountain hex. You may decide to find that elite monster using the standard combat rules. The hex must be liberated, so if I would enter this mountain hex, I would have to combat this monster first before fighting that elite monster. When you win the combat, take the reward shown on the card, but don't place any of your hero tokens on the hex. Instead, take the elite monster card and place it face down next to your player board. Elite monster cards can be used to fulfill the quest. Level one elite monster counts as the level one regular monster. At the end of your turn, reveal the new bounty card and find a corresponding monster. If you lose the combat and die, the elite monster card stays on top of the stack. So that's how you play Uthia Torment of Resurrection. If you would have any questions or comments, I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. If you like the series, please subscribe. You can even support the channel on the Patreon page. You've been watching Game in a Nutshell. My name is Branislav Berec and hope to see you next time.